Hello. Hello. Hey. Hey, hey. Jatinda, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, not bad. Just got up like five minutes ago and I'm going back to bed <laughs> after this, but you know, it's working on uh, content till 6 a.m., so I've had about th four hours sleep. It's pretty oh, standard, but hey, never mind. That's how it goes. Well, I'm sorry, sorry to disturb you. <laughs> Don't worry about it, it's entirely fine. I should be up anyway. Cool. Um, yeah. So, do you want me to quickly fill you in? Uh, I don't know how much uh, Christian uh, let you know. Uh, the ba the very, very basics. Uh, so, yeah, fill me in. Okay, so we're, um, so we're launching with a film, a short film called uh, Dark Side of Gaming next sure. week okay. on Tuesday. And we've interviewed quite a few uh, women gamers. It's mostly about harassment that women, female gamers get. Right. And we've interviewed, we've interviewed people like uh, like Alana Pierce, kind of just general questions. Like, yeah, she was know. on my podcast. She's a great girl. Yeah, and um, and a Julia Hardy as well. I think she was also on your podcast. Uh, she was as well. Yes, actually, yeah. we've been uh, we've got a two for two. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, just asking about the kind of harassment they get. Yeah, sure. And, yeah. Um, and b because it's so very, we feel it's. The only male voice we have that in that is KSI. Right. Oh, oh, and, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> a few bits were cut out, obviously. Uh, I, I, yes, I imagine they were. <laughs> <laughs> and so we wanted. To, I wanted to do kind of like a balance. Um, right. Yes. So, okay. Uh, so um, I've been asked to write an article um, as as a gamer, as um, my experiences. Um, also, being an ethnic minority as well. You know, sure. Yeah. Out. Totally. A lot of, Great slurs thrown my way. Lovely. Yes, I can unfortunately imagine. And um, yeah, and you're such a, a prominent figure in the community, and I think with with a, a lot of things that have happened over the recent years and uh, your recent decision to leave social media, I think you'd be an amazing voice to have. Sure, totally. So yeah, just a few. I'll start off with a few generic questions. Um, yeah, yeah, go for it. Just to fill things out. Um, so very very basic. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Uh, so my name is John Bain, I'm 31 years old, I'm actually a law graduate from De Montfort University uh, who decided that it would actually be more profitable to review games on YouTube and uh, it turns out I might have been right actually with the uh, <laughs> contracting law sector the way that it is at the moment. So yeah, I'm a full-time games critic that uses primarily YouTube but also Twitch TV live streaming to create my content. Yeah, um, I imagine you... Uh... Had you not gone down this path, you've been enjoying yourself with all the React trademarks going on right now. Oh, that, that would have been hilarious. I mean, UK trademark law is slightly less insane than US trademark law, but it's almost, almost as silly. So, um, how, um, outside of YouTube, how long have you been gaming? I, I, the first game that I remember was uh, at th when I was three years old on the BBC Micro Model B. 32 kilobytes of RAM, uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Actually, I think we got that later. We were loading off tapes originally. Uh, and I was playing, I think it was Granny's Garden, actually, which is, uh, you remember, I can see it on your face, that evil uh, edutainment game. We had it on, we had like, a, I imagine it must have been an updated version when I was in primary school. Mm -hmm. Granny's Garden, that definitely sounds familiar. Mm. That scared like. the heck out of me as a child. That The hook-nosed witch that would come up when you got the... <laughs> Maths problem incorrect. Yeah, that was uh, that was brutal. Oh god, I didn't realize it was so old. It is. It absolutely god. is. Yeah, I was, I was in primary school around ninety nine, so that's when I played it. But oh my god, really goes back that far. It, wow. it really does. I know they did iterate it over the years, but yeah, it is absolutely ancient. Is that and uh, a few different text adventures on that particular <laughs> machine that I was playing back then? And yeah, I mean, you know, evolved from there. I used to play on uh, BBC and then on the old Acorn Archimedes machines that we used to have in school as well. We had one of those at home, and uh, eventually PC. And I think it was it took until I was sixteen until I had a games console. I was always uh, playing it over at my friend's house. Uh, my parents always believed in the computer as something that could be educational as well as entertaining, and uh, I guess that kind of uh, stuck with me because I'm primarily a PC gaming critic now and arguably the biggest one on YouTube, so. But, uh, I'm interested. What was, your first, what was your first console at 16? I, it was actually a Sega Saturn, a second-hand Sega Saturn, which really, uh, hey, that, that got me bullied at school, actually. I, I remember it very distinctly, even at that age, because at that time the Saturn had pretty much commercially failed, and everyone had a PlayStation. You know, 
You could, there were a few guys that had an N64, and people kind of left them alone because that was a bit pricey, you know. But the Sega Saturn was looked down upon as being the wrong choice because the PlayStation had won so convincingly in that particular console war that owning one was almost like coming to school in knockoff, you know, Air Jordans or something like that. You know, you were you were the the kid with the cheap option, the wrong option. I picked it because my friend had a bunch of really interesting games on it that I really enjoyed when I went over to his place. So I just had to pick up one second hand once I saved up the money to do it just so I could play those same games. But it was quite surprising to find out that most of my peers at school did not agree with my decision. Yeah, the console wars were back then very, in, in primary school, very intensive and just as good in general. Yeah, I, I mean, you one could argue they still are if you pay attention to the internet. Well, yeah, we just yeah bigger platform to do it. Indeed. Um, yeah, um, and what about playing games online? So you said you're primarily a PC gamer now. When did that start for you? When did uh, you first discover online gaming? So very, very early, actually. And it was through the so-called Telnet protocol, which was originally used by educational foundations to access information, research papers, etc. Someone, of course, figured out that you could create a so-called MUD, multi-user dungeon which was a multiplayer text-based adventure and it was you know the the precursor to mmos really and i played one called multi-users in middle earth which was as you might imagine a lord of the rings game it had full pvp you could play a troll character that would literally be deleted once you went outside into the sun it was it was brutal. People think Dark Souls was a hard game these days. <laughs> you ain't seen nothing. It was it was crazy. Uh, but as a as a younger child, I was able to play that. Although of course we did have to pay by the minute for the internet, so we weren't exactly too hardcore when it came to online gaming. Right. God. So I I struggle with Dark Souls. So I think everybody does. I, could, I, I couldn't imagine playing something like that. Oh, it, 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 it was crazy. I mean, when, when, in PvP, where you had to type in north south east or west to move so you had to know the map so well to run away from somebody because you had to be able to type that faster than they could and not run into a wall it was it was insane absolutely insane and so as as a uh, as obviously online gaming went further um stuff like text uh, like um voice chat was brought in yeah when was your first experience with uh, stuff like that with voice chat, oh, it was probably with Microsoft's The Zone, I believe they brought in a fairly primitive version of it. Uh, there was uh, something called, what, what was the name of it? Mm. It was it was almost like a call sign, almost like a military call sign. Roger Wilco was the name of the application. Uh, that was a, a big precursor to a lot of the voice over IP we have today, like Skype, Ventrilo, TeamSpeak, and so on and so forth. Games didn't have voice over IP built in, in fact games that did they used it as a selling point they used it as the basis of the entire games marketing campaign that they actually had inbuilt voice and most people couldn't support it simply because they were using dial-up modems they just didn't have the bandwidth you know voice chat was very expensive bandwidth wise so i think the first time was definitely as a as a later teenager with uh, one of those games on microsoft's the zone and i was able to use a very primitive voice over ip at that point right and do you think okay and um so as I see, it's become so much more easier now. Um, yes. Game games have built-in voice chat. Uh, consoles have helped a lot with that, I think, because yeah, it's so it's so easy to do. Yeah. Um, um, do you think like what, any experiences you've had? Do you use? I mean, obviously not anymore. But were there times when you used the in-game chat and you would talk to everybody? And what kind of like the typical kind of abuse was thrown around? Any um, any experiences of that? Uh, sure, yeah. It's it's different now because there's a lot of recognition for my name, which ha- is a double-edged sword. Half of that is you'll get people like, hey, I really love your videos and I love your content. Oh, is it really you? And the other half is I absolutely hate you and every possible insult you can come up with under you know God's green earth. It's, uh, there's, some of them are quite creative, but... There's uh, there's a definite difference between that and back then. 
I, back then, you would absolutely run into into those guys. You know, they, they, there's al- there's always be there'll always be somebody that would be hurling out insults for whatever reason, whether it be the quality of your gameplay, whether just they don't like your username, they just had a bad day, they were just looking to get a reaction out of you. You know, the the original definition of trolling, of course. You know, deliberately saying something inflammatory to someone in order to provoke a reaction. It certainly existed back then. I think it, it's a bit more ubiquitous now because almost everybody has a microphone, whereas back then, you know, it was a uh, fairly rare for somebody to have the setup for, to allow that to happen. Uh, I don't necessarily think that, you know, had I not got this job and this sort of level of prominence online in the gaming scene, I don't think there would have been a difference between what was said back then and what is said now. You know, it was equally offensive. The terms may have changed, especially with influence from the kind of boards that create these insults. You know, I think you may have noticed recently that uh, 4chan has taken to calling people cuckolds, which is interesting. They're obviously scholars of Othello. Uh, hey. But, yeah, cuck is apparently a thing now. I, yeah, I don't know where that came from. I, um, don't, I don't know either. I, I mean, I, I, I'll take it over autist. I think it's much less offensive than that. Um, but uh, it, they, you know, some, there is definitely influence from those groups as to what the insult of the day is, the kind of go-to, less creative insult. Uh, but that element was always there. I remember posting on news groups when I was much, much, much younger. Of course, you know, no one really does that anymore. And we'd get into the same arguments. We'd see the same insults. Uh, even BBSs, bulletin board systems that you had to dial into were back in the late 80s, early 90s. There would be that guy, you know, that guy who hated everybody and wanted everybody to know it. And you would get that level of unpleasantness from him. It, it maybe was easier to get rid of them because those places were highly moderated and had smaller communities. It's, it's very hard to truly get rid of a troll online these days because of how easy it is to either re-register a new account or simply how many there will be. Like, you know, Social media is in, insane. You know, I, I have almost half a million Twitter followers. Back then, I could have never even imagined so many people reading something that I had to say. And if even a fraction of those people decide to respond negatively, that, that feels like an overwhelming tide of negative emotion. What do you, what do you, what's your opinion? A bit, a bit diverse, but opinions of new Twitter's new kind of safety advice council thing that they've set up. Um, the, the problem with something like that is that it puts what frankly should be a technologically created system into the hands of people, people who have a political agenda one way or the other. Now, do I think that Twitter should be doing more to handle harassment and trolling? Yes, but I think that they should be doing it through their technology and giving the user the control over what they can filter. You know, I actually I wrote a blog post over a year ago about several practical things that Twitter could do to cut down on online harassment, and it was all about giving power to the user. For instance, especially as somebody that has a lot of followers, I would love a feature that automatically filtered out any message that came from someone with an avatar that was an egg. Right? <laughs> because you'd be surprised how many trolls are so lazy that they can't even be bothered to set up a proper account. Uh, we, we actually tested and what were found to be very successful a feature on one of our community forums that would not allow somebody to post until their account was seven days old. Almost like a you know a background check for owning a gun in the US. Now, because if someone is willing to wait a week to say that unpleasant thing to you, and they're still that angry after a week, then okay. But the chances are, they've probably calmed down and forgotten about it after a week. Whatever horrible thing they wanted to say, they probably moved on by then. Now, that's another feature that Twitter could put in that they don't. They block almost all computer-side third-party clients. So I can't download a program for my PC that would have those options, those additional options that Twitter doesn't have, because Twitter just doesn't let people make that sort of program. So while I can see what they're doing, and obviously their intentions, at least from the outset, seem to be good. I know some people will disagree on a political level, but I I think that it's the it's not the ideal way to handle it, and Twitter could handle this with technology, and they've been sorely slacking on that front over the past few years, probably because of their prominence in the marketplace. They felt no need to improve because they're already that popular. Yeah, there's been quite, like, the amount of things you can see on Twitter is incredibly ridiculous, and it, yeah. it's always, it always struck me as odd, like, things they will 
ban and things they want. Yeah, it's it's very it's very strange. It, 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 did you know, for instance, that even if you block somebody, if you are logged out of Twitter, you can still see whatever they sent to you, and so can all of your followers. Yeah. Which, I, I, again, I wrote in that same blog earlier, is one of the prime vectors for trolling. It's they, You can hurt, uh, say, an online personality or somebody with a following by going after their audience instead of them. And blocking them makes no difference if, if they decide to do that because they will elicit a response from your audience, upset them, and, you know, in turn, you see that as a content creator. I'm like, well, you know, what are you doing to my fans? You know, I'm not okay with this, and you're upset by that by proxy. So, and, and Twitter has done absolutely nothing to stop that at any point during its entire existence. And they need to realize that that's what's happening a lot of the time. Okay, and but what, kind, what kind of effect does that have on you, whether it's like within gaming, someone doing insults to you, but within, within Twitter, like, how does that affect you as a person, constantly seeing these things thrown your way? Oh, well, I mean, I went into therapy. It, it's that simple. I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to the fact that I don't think I was ever built to handle... You know, I, I suppose I call it fame to some degree. Where a lot of people online are in this really weird position where they have exposure, which is on the level of minor celebrities, you know, television stars, radio stars. But we have none of the protection. We have none of the management. We don't have a PR person. We don't have an agent. We don't have a guy that reads our Twitter for us. You know, we uh, we're expected to be intimately connected to our fan base because a lot of the early successes on YouTube and the internet were exactly that. People that had intimately connected. And shared their life with somebody online and people that had felt that that was almost a friendship in a way where really it's actually a parasocial relationship where one person has a lot more power than the other and there's a huge potential for abuse there actually by the by the person with the thing you know they can exploit that connection with their users for money and anything like that i i, I don't think i was ever built to handle it i don't think most people are I, Almost, I would say that almost everybody I know that's had a, that created a decent following on the internet has at some point either had some sort of breakdown or has gone into therapy to deal with it or both because they simply can't handle how overwhelming it is. To me, at my worst times, it felt like a tidal wave, a never-ending 24-7 tidal wave of opinion that would just come at you. There was no breaks, you know, 24-7. You're getting messages from people in every country on the planet. And yeah, while most of those are positive, we're wired to remember the negative. And it can, or just one negative comment can just grind away in your brain all day. It can, it's poisonous. It, it's, um, it, it, can, it can certainly be a very damaging thing. And we're still sort of learning how to cope with it. I think not only as people that do this stuff online, but... In general, as as a human race, we're trying to figure out how do we deal with these voices in our head all the time, and I don't know what the answer to that is, other than stick your fingers in your ears and don't listen to any of it. Um, one 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 common thing people say is usually, "Oh, it's just it's just words on a screen, it's just comments." Why is it? Why does it affect you? Do you think? Do you think it's easy for some people to shrug off? Do you think maybe you're not as built for it or do you think like no matter who you are just this constant abuse is always going to affect you i I, obviously i think there's there's going to be a degree of subjectivity there some people are more resistant to that sort of thing than others some people are more sensitive to that than others it's just how we're built as human beings but let's be honest i think we threw sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me out of the window a long long time ago even in my generation much less this one so it's always going to hurt to some degree we shouldn't pretend that words on a screen are not harmful but we should also at least try to take a step back and remember that the anonymity of the internet and the ability to play any kind of persona with very few consequences for your actions does tend to bring out the worst in people and for instance for all the abuse that i've received online for all the death threats for all of the horrible things that people have said to me whenever i've gone to a gaming event such as pax or e3 or a big gaming convention or an esports event the number of negative experiences i've had with people that i've met at those places and i have literally met thousands has been a big fat zero it just does not happen anywhere near as much in real life with these people either the people who are trolling don't go to these events or their trolling was strictly online. And while I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for people that go and abuse others online, and they should certainly not be doing it, it's also worth trying to think, well, 
Is there a reason why they're acting this way? Is this because they have a really crappy life? Do they have problems at home? Do they have a drug problem? Do they have psychological issues? A lot of these guys, and a lot of them are guys, but of course if you go into the fandoms of things like boy bands, you'll see some of the most horrendous stuff coming from teenage girls, you know. Uh, they can be extremely vicious when it comes to fandoms. But when you think about uh, gaming in particular, you have probably a fairly high proportion of people who are uh, perhaps even undiagnosed high-functioning autistics, people with Asperger's syndrome, people that they don't have social skills, and it comes through online in some of the worst possible ways. And while I'm not condoning their behavior, it's important to note that the vast, vast, vast majority of some people that say, I'm going to kill you, online would never even consider carrying that out in real life you know it's not they're not credible threats they're the actions of an angry lonely possibly socially stunted person and you always have to take that into account yeah definitely um i think slightly bringing it back into gaming sure um there was a video by cat tales i'm sure I'm yes i probably um, watched it yep um, yeah, it was it was um, about why, why gamers are so angry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, um, and um, one of the points she brings up, like it's part she, she suggests because it's you know it's in in the name, it's gaming, it's part of competition. Yeah, okay. Um, do some really do really, some really mean it? It's just within the heat of the moment they say these angry things, but mm-hmm. yeah. it's just yeah because it's competition. Like you catch a sports person off guard. Um, yeah, they 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 will say some. Horrible things. Horrible you, things. Well, f- football, footballers. Yes. Um, do you think it's fair to apply the same kind of thinking to gaming, uh, sports? I definitely think there's a huge element of that. Um, sorry, did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, you, I, I cut you off. I apologize. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, well, the principle of gaming, even back to the first video games, was about competition. You know, Tennis for Two well, is, a comp- is a competitive game. You know, it's, it's one person versus another in a game of uh, blocky tennis. And since then, it's either been player versus player or player versus environment, what we call PvE. And that's competing against something. The competitive side of gaming is, in my opinion, and this is actually backed up by science quite well, is the reason why a few studies came out and linked aggression to the playing of video games. And aggression comes from competition. And we'll see, well, you see exactly the same results in sports and any other competitive activity. So there's definitely an element of that. Does it excuse it? Well, no, it doesn't. And saying things in the heat of the moment while, you know, you can understand it but not condone it is not a good reason to to go after somebody. But the question, you know, and I think the big difference between what is real online harassment and what is simply awful things said in the heat of the moment is how long after the event those people are willing to continue that level of abuse you know do they are they willing to stalk somebody online are they willing to try and dox them to track down their personal information are they willing to try and get them fired from their job are, once it crosses into the real world you know, that's when you can say that this has gone far far beyond anything that you could consider heat of the moment competitive trash talking i suppose but i i think she is definitely on the money in that respect i don't think it's the sole aspect to it because again if you look at other fandoms such as boy bands and things like that, that are not competitive at all, you still see some of the most horrible things said online. You know, teenage girls trying to drive other girls to suicide because they don't like the same boy band that they like. That's that's a real thing. That's not made up. That happens constantly. And cyberbullying in particular, you know, is focused around non-competitive activities too. So it's, it's definitely part of it, certainly. I don't think it's the sole cause of it, but it, it's a significant factor. Now, uh, onto Gamergate, unfortunately. Mm. Hey, um, I've, I've dealt with this for two years. Don't worry. Any question yeah, you can throw at me, I'm ready for. <laughs> huge mess. Yes. But, um, so regard, I think from my perspective, regardless of what size you were on, you high chance you were getting harassed by somebody. Absolutely um, correct. Um, and I, I do think that was, like, only one, unfortunately, only one side was reported, even here at the BBC. Like, it was very rare for them to actually yeah. give... That's very true. A pro gamergate voice. Um, why do you? Well, why do you think that was? Well, honestly, we, you know, we're obviously entering into an age where I'm not going to use the term political correctness, where 
there are certain concerns, uh, especially based around um, identity politics and gender politics, that have come to the fore. And it is in the best interests of many websites who, frankly, are dying off, actually. You know, particularly in gaming, YouTube and Twitch have supplanted the traditional games website as the place that most people go to get their info. And these, these places are slowly dying off. And you've seen in correlation with that a shift towards writing articles which are politically driven, that are controversial in some way. And it's certainly not controversial to say that women should not be harassed on the internet. It's also not controversial to say that nobody should be harassed on the internet. Uh, but I think that a lot of these websites definitely jumped on a, a particular bandwagon. You, you've got to bear in mind that the same websites that were reporting a fairly one-sided view of what Gamergate was, it's not that they were lying necessarily, but they were telling only part of the truth, were also implicated in uh, ethical scandals that were brought up during the whole thing. Now, uh, Kotaku, which is uh, one of the sites that wrote quite a lot about Gamergate and certainly sided against it, were actually the cause of the whole thing if you were to go back to the original incident which sparked it off, which was uh, a, an indie developer who was accused of essentially having a nepotistic relationship with a journalist. And really it was more about, at least in my eyes, the journalist allowing that to happen. You know, I think it's in a developer's best interest to get good press any way you possibly can. If you decide that being friends or even engaging in a romantic fling with a journalist is a way to get positive press, that's your prerogative. You know, and, and you, you as a, as a developer, have no ethical requirement on you at that point. But the journalist does. You know, the journalist at that point should be recusing themselves. And uh, if you read any journalistic guidelines, you'll know that that's true. The, the reporting really centers around, you know, who, who has the power in those particular traditional gaming press circles and who was able to spark off a wave of, of narrative that was very similar to each other and a lot of those people were involved in a group that was i suppose the gaming journalist equivalent of the journal list which was something that was exposed a long time ago where certain journalists were kind of conspiring i suppose at least that's what some people argued to present a particular narrative and they were working together despite the fact that they should have been in competition with each other there was a, a game journalist pro was the mailing list that a lot of these guys were on and they were talking amongst themselves in some ways in a way that made no sense to me certainly as somebody that produces gaming media I was like aren't you guys supposed to be competing with each other aren't your websites dying off shouldn't you not be working together here and it resulted in at least 17 plus articles released on the same day that all followed this very similar idea that gamer as a term and as an identity is dead and they were very very similar to each other they, they cross-linked to each other it was almost like it was a coordinated narrative which which sounded very i mean it seemed very suspicious to a lot of people certainly i think uh, but ultimately it was in the best interests of most sites to write in such a way that presented gamergate as an issue first and foremost of the harassment of female developers and those involved in, in the games industry even though frankly there wasn't a huge amount of evidence that this was going on on a grand scale there were three people in particular who seemed to be copying a lot of the flack and who were making the headlines, but there are thousands and thousands of women who work in the game's development scene. It is disproportionate. Yes, it's a male-dominated industry, and I certainly hope for that to change, and it is changing. Year on year, we're getting more and more women being involved in this industry, and that's fantastic because it's a creative industry, and we need as many minorities involved as possible because that that's what makes interesting stories, right? Uh, but... I didn't see thousands and thousands of women in the development team coming out of the woodwork and saying, yeah, we're, we're getting, our lives are being ruined by this. It was a very, very small number of people who were very vocal about it on social media. I'm not saying harassment didn't happen. It absolutely did. But as you mentioned in the question, it was happening on all sides. And it still is. You know, the, there seems to be a dedicated group of people whose sole mission is to make other people's lives miserable. And which group they are a part of, well, we don't know. They just need to include a hashtag in their tweet. There's no membership card for Gamergate or anti-Gamergate or whatever. Literally anybody can say, hey, in the name of Gamergate, I think you should go die in a fire. You know, it's, it, it's the unfortunate reality of social media and an anonymity that you can't really apply the actions of a group when it's not really a group at all. It's just, it's just a hashtag that anybody can use. During that period, 
and like you said, it's still happening as well. But how bad was the harassment for you? What kind of things was thrown your way? Because um, uh, you were very vocal in that. Initially. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I was definitely one of the the most vocal people that that sort of went that definitely was explicitly on the side of we need to be ethical in our industry. You know, because I've been pro consumer from the very start. It's the platform that I have made my career on, and. When it comes to ethical concerns, you know, I think they are they are very real, and gaming journalism has had corruption in it for decades. You know, it's actually not as bad as it used to be. I mean, well, you know, payola was a literal thing in games magazines for a while. We will pay you money to give us a good score. That's a real thing. That's happened. And right now on YouTube in particular, we have new challenges with the FTC disclosure, which I'm very glad that they brought in. The amount of YouTubers that were taking brand deals and promotional deals without disclosing that they'd taken money for the promotion of those products you know there's there's a lot of very real ethical concerns and i'm kind of on the fringe of all of that but the harassment that i received the the one that really sticks in my mind as probably the most egregious was there was a charity event being held for a charity that deals with gamers with disabilities and tries to help them out by buying them equipment and also pushing games companies to include options in those games to support people with disabilities. You know, most common example would be color deficiency. You know, those that are colorblind can't play quite a lot of games because they use the wrong kind of colors in the interface that can't differentiate between friend or foe. So this charity, Able Gamers, pushes companies to include those options. And I've been affiliated with them for quite a while. And I saw this stream go up, and this was through social media. A friend of mine had retweeted the stream, and the stream has explicitly asked people, please retweet. So what did I do? I retweeted it. And then I went into chemotherapy that day. And I checked Twitter about an hour into my chemo session, and my feed was full of death threats for the most part. Um, A lot of people, especially uh, who knew about my condition, because it was quite public, you know, saying that I hope cancer gets you quickly. And other people saying, you know, I will, I will come and kill you. I will rape your wife. I will kill your child, etc., etc. I, mean, I counted well over a hundred instances in the course of an hour from a hundred different people, of people saying pretty horrible things. Now, this had come as a result of the person who was running the stream basically having an online freakout, believing that my retweeting was so-called weaponized retweeting, that I had retweeted it solely to send a mob of harassment to them. Which, of course, was nonsense. Uh, it was a charity that I was publicly affiliated with. Of course, I would have retweeted it. And they asked for the retweet in the first place. So I gave it to them. And the person turned around, made a bunch of accusations. Um, then somebody else created what's called a Storify, which is a selection of edited tweets that you can present in a timeline. It's very good for creating a narrative. And they presented it in... It, even with their attempts to twist it, it still didn't look good on them, but... That group uh, went after me, and the harassment last for, lasted for weeks. And uh, ever since I publicly declared that I had an interest in the ethical side of this whole debate, I've received nothing but harassment. Blogs have been written telling me that I should be—I should leave the industry. I should. You know, there were people saying that I am a harmful influence in the industry. Some developers turned on me, said they would deny me uh, code for their games, which isn't really too much of a problem. But you know, people just saying condemning me in general as a critic. You know, I, I'd lost several friends actually over the whole thing and in general i received you know almost two years of constant day-to-day harassment the most vicious stuff that i've ever had in my career and that was coming from people who supposedly were on the side of uh, you know who are self-proclaimed social justice advocates who were on the side of the right as they thought yeah so it, it just seemed very hypocritical to be coming from people like that I think it was also at that time that I remember seeing an article, like, why why we no longer need Total Biscuit. Yes, uh, oh, yeah. was, that was written by a very, very small-time developer on Gama Sutra. Um, I don't pay attention to people like that. It's uh, what, What's the phrase? The lion does not concern himself with the opinions of sheep, but uh, something along those lines. Uh, he, I mean, he hasn't even produced a commercial game. So, honestly, he's not really in a position to be telling anybody to get out of the industry because he's barely in it to begin with. No, he, he's a little... That guy's a little odd. I mean, if, if you've done any research on David Gallant, and I'm sure you have, he has said some very uh, questionable things, uh, including, which I imagine you will not write in your article, that uh, he was uh, literally masturbating to the thought of uh, uh, Gamergate harassing him or something along those lines. It's like, you're a, you're a 
A bit of a, a bit of an odd egg, you. Uh, I, I don't understand you, but okay. Whatever, whatever suits you, I guess. Indeed, whatever floats <laughs> you, bro. I'm not, I'm not going to judge your habits. You know, you, you do what feels right. And um, yeah, finally, obviously, as you mentioned, um, unfortunately, uh, you got um, you got cancer. Did you yep. think that became a new target as well? Because I remember you, you, there was a point in time where you felt you you got rid of it, and then it unfortunately it, it came back. Yeah, it came back, yeah, uh, form, yeah. Um, do you think that became a new target? And do you think with it returning and just constant abuse led to your recent departure from social media? Like, what was that whole process? Uh, yeah, so I mean. As, as people are probably aware at this point, you know, stress is actually a huge factor in the exacerbation of cancer. I mean, high stress people are at a much higher risk of contracting the disease and it also aggravates the disease. You know, the stress is a very real thing that affects our bodies in a multitude of negative ways. And naturally, I was in two minds about even telling the internet that I had it because I knew that it would become a new attack vector. So there was something I wrote over a year ago that was talking about online harassment. And what I was saying was that for trolls, trolls look for attack vectors. And since quite a lot of trolls are, are sexist, they view like someone's gender as an attack vector. And especially if you happen to be a minority on the internet or in gaming, they can use that status, or at least they believe they can use that status as something to attack you for. But if they don't have that, they'll find something else. Something it's Because they're looking for the most personal gap in your armor. You know, and that that may at at some points be your race because the person may feel a bit insecure. They may feel uh, worse, threatened because they happen to be a minority. So receiving a racial attack will hurt them more than receiving an attack based on something else. But uh, for me in particular, most of the attacks that I receive are based on my appearance or my work. You know, I, I think uh, it's a very effective attack vector to go after a male in particular in today's society and go after their career because we define a lot of our self-esteem through our career success unfortunately that's a the way that society has conditioned us to believe that our worth comes from uh, cancer in particular was something that people have used to try and attack me i i felt it's not been all that effective because really what can they do that's worse than what is already being done to me but they have some of them the really smart ones have realized that it's not me they can go after with that it's my family it's my wife they can go to my wife and say how does it feel that your husband is going to die soon and leave you and that hurts her and by proxy that hurts me and it you know it's definitely part of the decision why i decided you know what social media is a is a misnomer it's anti-social media you know it, it, once it get gets past a certain point in size it is anti-social media. People, they're just looking for attention from those that they follow for whatever reason. And negative attention for them can be just as good as positive. And they, they'll provoke a reaction from you to get it. They will attack you to increase their self-esteem. to make you know They want to tear you down to their level to make them feel better about themselves. And at that point, I decided enough is enough. You know, I'd, I want to live my life and not feel like I'm shackled to this system which makes me so miserable on a daily basis i don't see any need to continue to involve in that i don't think i'm required to i don't think anyone is required to but i think the demands of modern society have a, put a certain impetus on us to be connected all the time i think it's fundamentally unhealthy i don't think he, the hu human condition was ever ever designed to deal with that and it's caused so much pain and hurt to people over the last few years myself included so i i hope that as a result of me talking about my illness, that people will get checked, particularly young males are very embarrassed about going to uh, to get screened, especially for my kind of cancer. And it was my embarrassment that caused me to to get this in the first place. You know, I'd, So I've re definitely received additional harassment as a result of it, but if I save even one person's life because they went to get screened earlier, then it was, it was all worth it, you know? No doubt about it. Yeah, I think... I'm, I'm terribly bad at getting checkups for anything. It's something I definitely should improve on. Yeah, a lot of I us are, unfortunately. Yeah. I've, I've, been, I've moved down to London a year and a half ago. I'm still not registered with any doctors here. Yeah. I'm, I'm still back up in Leeds. Then. Yeah, reminds me of university when I just I had a toe infection. I just refused to go. It's like, no, nope, not going to the doctor. I'll stick it in salt water. It'll be fine. And then walking to work every day for two miles in absolute agony as a result <laughs> of that. It's like, oh, can I just chop it off, you know? 
Uh, yeah, but unfortunately, for some reason, we seem to be wired just to, as males in particular, just to suck it up. You know, we're told to just suck it up. You know, when we talk about man flu, we get laughed at, even though it's scientifically proven to actually be quite painful for males. Um, it's, you know, if you want to talk about the problems with gender identity, you know, there's, there's one of them. You know, males are expected to be stoic and not complain and not admit vulnerability. And going to the doctor is the ultimate admission of vulnerability, right? Yeah, I guess so. You can't do it on your own, but you have to go to someone else. Yeah, you've got to rely on somebody else. You've got to admit that you're sick, you know? Yeah. Well, thanks very much. This has been uh, really good. Thank you so much for saying, uh, thank you for doing it. Um, yeah, sure. I, I was honestly wasn't sure that you would. It's been such a quick turnaround as well, so thank, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, I mean, I, I was in two minds about it. Uh, you know, my PR guy was like, do you really want to do this? I'm like, you know what? Uh, I, Despite some of the things that have gone on recently, I still trust the BBC as an organization, so <laughs> I, I'm willing to put my, uh, my words in the hands of the BBC and see what happens and you know, hope not to be disappointed. That's all I can say. So I'll, I'll try not to. Thank I, you. I'm, um, sure, I'm sure you won't. Thank you. Uh, just one final thing, just, just uh, yeah, for compliance reasons. Sure, yeah, can of I- course. And I just have you say, like, you're happy for me to use. Um, I, I have been recording this, uh, the audio. I've been taking notes. But you're happy yep. for me to use this footage if I ever need to, and you're happy for me to tell me. Uh, I'm, I'm but, happy. I give full permission for you to use this footage uh, in the context of journalistic work. And, yeah, you can follow up if you need any, que- uh, any more questions answered. Yeah, amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, la- I'll, I'll leave you to get back to sleep. And get I, I might, you know, I might. That sounds like a good idea. I've got a lot of work to do today, so i got to make sure I'm alert for it. But yeah, thanks, thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot for your time.